Hey, why are you here? <sighs> well, Tamsoft made a game about zombies infesting a high school because they, instead of brains, lust only for schoolgirls' school uniforms. Wow, I know, very cool. They called it SG slash ZH, schoolgirl slash zombie hunter, a name I respect immensely in its dumbnitude. It is illegal to shorten it. One always has to spell and read SG slash ZH, schoolgirl slash zombie hunter in full every time one mentions SG slash ZH schoolgirl slash zombie hunter. Same way it's impossible to skimp out on Tamsoft other games' title. Summertime High School, A Young Man's Notes. How a new exchange student like myself ran into his high school friend on the school tour, then for some reason became super popular with the girls for his daily scoops on the school photography club even though Now, of course, this be the type of game to have a underwear timer, counting the time a character has worn a titular piece of underwear. This be the type of game to use like three fucking songs for the whole seven hours of it. This be the type of game where one of the splash screens upon boot up straight up just doesn't work. And it's also the type of game to be a pretty simple missions-based third-person shootoid set within a school. You play as a bunch of girls who I think all have the same exact face, or at least varieties of two faces where only how they wear said faces expression-wise and things like hair and colors making any distinctions. They're all childhood friends, of course, and so they constantly, nauseatingly, unendingly, and annoyingly talk exclusively about this fact. Why the zombies are here? isn't really that important, nor is why or how they're all decked out and strapped up like this, but there is this edgy cool guy who's the boss of the zombies, so uh, I don't know, they're a gang I guess. Gotta be honest, we're not exactly cooking with hella ingredients here plot-wise, which to its credit is pretty fitting for how Tamsoft do. Thing is, this is a sister series of the One Chan Bara franchise, a tale that started with a PS2 tech scrawl and repetitive levels, but would eventually sprawl into a fun cutscenes film colorful series of actually fairly competent hack and slashers on PS4. And while SG slash ZH schoolgirl slash zombie hunter isn't quite on PS2 simple series budget garbage level, it sure as shit didn't have a whole decade's worth of incremental development to stand on foundationally either. Cause man goddamn is this ever a dumbass meat ass headed shooter game. And trust me, I get it. I'm well aware of the track that they were on. I, I know all about the long-standing tradition of Japanese meathead shooters. Your bullet witches, your Yakuza dead souls, your 10,000 bullets, your gun graves, the E, D, Fs. I like and adore all of them. As a lineage, they stand somewhat separately from both how and why shooters developed in America. Focusing not on skill at aiming or lame cowardly shit like finite ammo, but instead putting the aim on selling a power fantasy or a reenacting of a cool media trope or just big flyer in action. Evolving, mayhaps more so out of side scrolling run and guns like Gunstar Heroes than any seeds what Doom planted, so. Basically, mash and hold down buttons while you, yourself, become the bullet hell. Which would've been great fun here too, only um... Uh... Yeah, the... <laughs> the guns just fucking suck. The zombies, as well, are the exact same Muso zombies from its bigger sister game, and so all they do is saunter aimlessly, stand still, and deadass spawn in in plain view or straight right where you stand. And where, with machine gun, this is almost okay in a spray away with no thoughts sort of way, the pistols are all useless little BB guns that only let you pick them off one by one. The sniper rifle is the same deal, but even more useless given that nothing will ever ever be far away enough to even warranted existing, and the shotgun, while dealing by far the most damage, is busted because all bullets are hit scan based purely on the aim reticle, thus making the spray of bullets really fundamentally broken. 
<laughs> okay, that is pretty neat. Granted, it does have hella weapons, but only in the RPG sense where they have bigger numbers but won't handle any differently. Same goes for the characters. They'll all have a special move or whatever, or stats or cosmetics, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter who you're playing as or what you do with them, as they can all carry whatever. It is a big cast, I suppose, which is its main thing. The game sells itself as a co-op group experience, and certainly even offline when all the gals have pals, shit does come alive even if just through the audio-visual cacophony of it all. And I like that, but it's also a structured story-driven experience where the majority of stages feature only one or two girls paired up. One can go back to the older missions to group play them, but I don't wanna fucking do that, cause honestly this shit it's already repetitive enough as it is. You see, you deadass never leave the school. There's the main building itself and its three copy-pasted floors, a funny techno basement, a outside sports thing, and that's it. With the latter two only showing up a couple of times too, as for the most part, you're stuck in the same damn building. And I personally care about environmental variety probably more so than most other things and so that really started to kill things dead for me. I think if they had broken out of the school after the first four levels, sending the girls on a trip across the city, going downtown, maybe to a park or the burbs and like a sewer or subway level, I'd have been down with it. That would have made the game a cute journey of escape instead of them solely only lollygagging about the same three halls for seven hours because as it stands, I can only defend the quote unquote base so many times. When you get right down to it, SG slash Z ZH schoolgirl slash zombie hunter easily could have been like an hour long as many of the older simple series Tamsoft titles were. Budget games sold for budget prices, but maybe with dev costs bloating even in this penisy realm of gaming, a business model as such just wasn't viable anymore. And so they stretched that bitch out, made the characters disagree on every wee thing so that they would have to repeatedly backtrack past the same set of stairs to the same rooms just to re-review their own already set in stone itineraries, and blowed up levels by forcing the player to stay alive for lengthy times or by taking down hordes that block progress. Find things on their own, but much like these bitches, the stitches holding the design together are more than a little bit nakedly apparent at this point. <laughs> Man, talk about a hairline. <laughs> I do love this visual aesthetic though, whatever it even really is. The far better stretched and stitched EDF games have it also, Disaster Report has it, Yume Nikki Dream Diary had it, even the Yakuza games kinda do at times. It's almost as if they made a PSP or Vita game and remastered it by gussying it up with shaders from a Fidelity POV, though truthfully I think it might just be one of those things where the setting informs the vibe. Cause, I mean, Japanese cities do have a lot of very boxy buildings, a lot of whites and greys, and shit's generally pretty clean, so when you combine that with the sparsely detailed quickly made spaces with hurriedly wrapped textures, you start getting this... Uh, oh. let's just say that there's no reason for this surface to be this shiny, but that I love the fact that it is. And shout out to it using the MGS5 font, the Street Fighter 6 font, the Dio Field Chronicles font, the Deracine font, the Let It Die font, and even the Deadly Premonition 2 font, aka Kiwi Maru, the video game font of the past 10 years or so. It's free on Google and works with both alphabet and Japanese characters, hence why it shows up in Hella JP releases, cause it means they can just pick one across localizations. It's the working class hero of fonts, pretty much. Otherwise though, uh, yeah, I, I don't particularly like SG slash ZH schoolgirl slash zombie hunter all that much, if I'm honest. Normally, if I don't really fuck with a game, I simply won't bring it up, but I thought to do so here for two distinct reasons. For one, I love Tamsoft. I care for them and I want to see what they got up to from time to time. And for two, I've been making my own games slowly but surely in between vids and so me coming away from this realizing that above the jank, above the shitty game feel and above the characters that I low-key kind of hated, what really made me not vibe with this was the feeling that it needed more environmental variety. It's super fucking valuable because suddenly, 
I learn more about my own tastes. What I want is henceforth further crystallized and more easily weaponizable as a result. Cause fucking my own game will have desert towns, swampy streets, cavernous mines, big flats, big train journeys, haunted hotels, and whatever the hell else I come up with. Fuck yeah, I need that variety. I just gotta go places like how my brain does when I think and link shit up this way as yeah bitch, people said my 2022 run of so I've been playing had zine vibes. Well, this year, we're leaning into that bigly. Anything goes, and it might make sense. Stream of consciousness time, baby! Welcome to So I've Been Playing, the show where I talk about games and experiences I have experienced that I wasn't able to make fully fledged videos out of or repurpose otherwise. Cause goddamn, no, <laughs> I don't want to particularly make big dedicated videos about Yakuza Gaiden or 8, but goddamn, did I ever want to just heckin' play him. I'm not gonna lie, Ishin was actually the first Yakuza game I played while it was new. All the others I've lacked behind on, thus building up the dreaded Yakuza debt. You know, one day that deck collector is gonna come knocking like But that don't mean that I don't got shit to say. Like, if I don't make sure to check that worldwide weed is present in both games, no one will. Gotta confirm that my Zen spot beneath the Yakuza AC isn't taken over by these two losers, neither. Does look a smidge more high res though, or at the very least the shader on it is nicer, and it has an air sucky host now that it didn't have before. Wow, I also damn near thought Guy Ducey was gonna bring back the legendary fart shirt because I saw screens, but they means is means as it's merely a smart. Yeah. Game's alright though. I, I like that new Joryu protagonist guy. And so Tambori has its little homeless spark and mini mall back again, as well as the coin lockers, which was very fun and nostalgic. Should hit y'all with the spoiler screen right about now though, as well as a time code skip thing and probably a chapter situation, so you people can snipe it from the watch bar, provided I don't forget to add that. As you see, the sixth entry of the series was more or less framed as the end of Kiryu's tale, right? The core arc, if you will, of what the series had been about with the Tojo clan. Seven, as a result, was basically the passing of the torch, with Kiryu only doing a little mysterious cameo, and now Gaiden taking place during Seven, highlighting more of this cameo, seems to me as if a desperate clinging on to what once was but is no more. Narratively, gameplay literally, and even maybe cynically, being that they do be squeezing that Yaku lime a little bit. And this time, it's for real. Shishi though is such a perfect villain for this. If you type the dude's name into the Discord search thing, you see piles and piles of cute boy blingies, and that can only be because he is the most Yakuza-est Yakuza-ass guy. Covered in tattoos, scars, and shit, with a knife stuck in his hand, spewing blood, bile, and please about how he has nothing to go back to if the organized crime families disband. A classic yak, as Kiryu calls him, who despite all his efforts and plans to do things more sneakily, is still here. Clawing and barking in anger, reaching for a place in a series that he can't have, because that series has changed. He can't be a Ryuji Goda, a Daigo, or a Nishiki. The Yakuza is gone, and what's left is slimy politicians, government orgs, businesses, and corrupt cops, i.e. what Seven and Judgment deal with, which is also what his end will be in this. And this legit couldn't be a more thematic way to hammer these themes home one last time. Smashing each other through the Omi building, ending on its roof in the sunset, all taking place on the off-screen from what the new protagonist is already doing elsewhere. A side game filling in the blanks episode made manifest in classic Yakuza boss fight manliness. Just fucking beautiful and poetic. And I fucking love this series. Now, as for 8, I'm expecting that to be two distinct things following what 6, 7, and now Gaiden have done. 
aka a big massive celebration of the series being a gigantic game with all the bells whistles funny returns and cute wee callbacks for old time's sake as well as a proper actual kicking of of a new arc or era no longer about the tojo drama of games is past cutting those off as much as it possibly can definitively Easiest way to do that would probably be to give Kiryu cancer or some shit and to burn down the whole ass Tojo HQ and to just bring back the big diaper baby man and make him make diaper powder poop snow for a dying elderly couple and so that's also exactly what they did. The famous be spicy meme even gets a reference and right when Kiryu first reveals being deathly ill and having only a year or so left at most, Kasuga remarks that he has that same look as his boss man did. Putting scare you in the same place that all the weathered, tired, decrepit, and dying former heroes, villains, and other schisms of the past he's all blown past in past were in past. Which is pretty grave, not gonna lie, because it does highlight how despite all his rage, despite all he's tried to fight his way out or through things, the scumfuck Yakuza curse never really left him either. He didn't so much change the world as that the world just sort of changed around him essentially. Can't even be the protag in his own damn game no more due to his failing health. Slowly realizing that he now needs the help of others to do things with him and that, I mean, th that's the most literal torch passing there is and that he could do with some actual time off for once as well. In some ways, one could very well argue that the series didn't need this, that Six ended his story and that he could live on as little cameos like how he did in Seven, but me? I find that leaves things a bit incomplete. And the cameos may be even a little cheap or gimmicky. I'd, I'd rather he either definitively gets the last few years slash the life he deserves in true retirement, or simply that he needs to die. And this will then also be the main hook of the game on Kiryu's side. Across the pond, there's wild new settings, brand new characters, and all the funny new ills of the modern world to deal with. VTubers, world star motherfuckers, religious leaders, cops, and good old corruption. The Yakuza do still play a part in all of it, but the days of the... ...are fully over. <laughs> Uh, how they are still relevant is in two distinct ways. The first being commentary surrounding the very real five-year Yakuza clause that basically completely messes people over within Japanese society by barring them from Hela for having done a crime. And how this, as a realistic fallout from the dissolution in Seven, influences everything from setting up its story and its international pickle to tons and tons and tons of side characters, jobber enemies, past villains and whatever else being affected by it in various shitty ways. And the second is in a nostalgic context. You see, our dying boy gets several whole entire chapters of the game that are ostensibly centered around his friends, new and old, trying desperately to make him realize that, hey, if you get cancer treatment, you can have a few more years left that'll let you live a nice old life at the orphanage. Which, for Kiryu reasons, he doesn't want, cause he's Kiryu and he's Kiryu with Kiryu. And so, for one last time before it burns and dies, we take him to the old Tojo HQ where he can ponder the pots he'd use to smash proverbial dudes with. We have him spy on Yuya and Kazuki at Serena cause he's still legally dead and they can't know he's alive hence the clever disguises and stealth. They bring back the goddamn taxi cab boss man from 5 as well. And, 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 the heckin' Emoto Clinic which we ain't even been to since fucking 3. Not to mention how interesting a contrast this is to 6's roundup, being that a lot of that involved moving on thematically. Pocket Man, Jim Man, Yuya were all there shown to be living new lives in Six, and they're all here too, but 
reframed from more of a I believe in myself and will carry on lens, which is not a all too subtle hint at Kiryu's entire deal. Similarly, I love that he largely hangs out in the places of Seven and with its cast, because that also shows all of them from a very different light, merely due to how different he is as a protagonist, and how he gradually learns to suit this new fancy turn-based direction by opening up to help from them more too. It's all so thematically cohesive and emotionally resonant. It's very smartly pulled off, in my opinion. Which all came together for me when you finally do go back to, of course, Komorocho. Where, upon hearing the old Yakuza 1 battle theme, I actually fucking cried. Hey, hey, hey! Kachi go there! Thing is, so bizarre. Like, yeah, Kiryu is Kiryu, but he still changed a lot. How he looks, acts, plays. Komurocho has also changed a lot. This series, sure as shit, has changed a lot. Tonally, gameplayally, what it's about and how it behaves and feels. It is consistent, don't get me wrong, because it'll always be reminiscent of itself, being that that's one of its biggest strengths, and Nothing, nothing else could have hit home for me on a deep, guttural, emotional level. How much distance there is between this... ...and this. Because it ain't the Kiwami version either, it, it, it's the pure raw PS2 one, and that, man, uh, I don't know, it, it just made the whole Kiryu cancer thing feel so viscerally real. This guy... This guy right here, he's gone. Even if this guy survives this game, this guy is still gone. And that actually made me really sad. Especially being where it is in betwixt all the reminiscing scenes that really do pull some capital P pushing pulls acting as if pockets of the past surrounded by the present. Like they fucking acknowledge Dead Souls. Doing a little reminiscing of my own here, that's the game that got me into this series. I saw the classic Game Room review of it, not being familiar with the franchise at all and being so blown away by all that it had as a thing stood onto its own. It seemed unreal to me that something so to my tastes could exist and thus I fell in love with it then and there prior to having even touched the game myself. Because of this, just the mere mention of it here was quite emotionally potent for me within this entire context just as well. And I think that's a great note to end it on, as well it is, in my opinion, a better ending to Kiryu's story and life than 6 is, it is also the funny island dolphin fuck game with the vampire man and the dominatrix class and the crazy taxi minigame and the naked guy photography minigame and so, so much more, which I ain't even gonna talk about, cool as though it were, as I'm really only following up on what I said in this one ancient, decrepit video that I'm sure all of y'all remember in detail and have definitely seen. Speaking of seeing my content, I'm gonna talk more about Aiden in my next video too, though wholly spoiler free, cause, well, my playthrough here was 94 hours. That is disgusting, and the new Final Fantasy that I haven't even been able to touch yet is equally as large, and that can't be a coincidence, so my brain started thinking some big smart brain ideas, thus making my next video all about game length. It'll be cool and prescient. I'm not sure what that means. It's one of those words that Hazel uses. She's smart, so it probably means I'm smart. Damn, I am smart. <laughs>I'm like not a collector or anything, but I have way too much shit. Like, yeah, sure, I'll meme collect a little 360 skunk library, but I'm not at all in particular a stickler for the physical. I just don't trust any of the major publishers to not mess up their digital storefronts at any point in the future, and so now I have all of these fucking discs. And no more room for any new ones. But god damn it, I just wanted to play Ridge Racer 7. I wanted to go fast, but Michelle. Oh. 
I say, I dare say, I do say, I do declare that mayhaps it is time to hack. Yeah, look at this dusty, crusty piece of shit. I ain't cleaning that. It's character. This thing has been through it with me. All the shitholes I lived in in past. It was there. It's a lot to be a little battle scarred, okay? But that doesn't mean that I don't want it to do well mentally, internally. And Sony seems to be hell-bent on hurting it there. Like, I fucking hated that P update. Sony slowly ruining their own legacy console with QR codes and cumbersome login garbage. The only reason the PS3 gets updates nowadays is to punish the people who still like using it. And, well, I've had it. Beginning the process for me, naturally, first meant half a mental breakdown trying to format a weirdly partitioned USB stick. See, I've had some scary PC moments in the past. Busted Windows installs, fucked up drives, ghost partitions. And so I really, and I cannot stress how really, really do not like doing these sorts of things. One quarter or so of a panic attack later, I did manage it through the power of key spamming at my Discord server, aka tech support, and then the hacking itself went smooth and fine and nothing really worth mentioning. Uh, oh no. Mm, okay. Y yeah, I just gotta update it first for real. Uh, make sure the hack and the current version are in sync. That'll fix it. See, here we go. Now we just have to select the USB and... You know, now might also be the time to tell you that games that don't have official digital releases, like a lot of the earlier ones, tend not to run very well, just off of the hard disk, being that they weren't ever meant to. And of course, Ridge Racer 7 just so happened to be one of those, and so I had to buy a copy anyway. <sighs> You know, you know what? It's fine. I basically own every PS3 game worth shit already regardless. And all I really wanted was to simply go fast. It's one of those things I very much grew up around but never really explored myself all that much. Like, my dad was a massive Formula One head and also his side of the family is kind of a little bit ingrained with a biker gang. A lot of fuck and or shit came from that throughout my childhood but that did also mean that I was riding on the back of speeding motorcycles before I even had spent a single day in school. And recently I've been feeling those roots as I've been going on big bikey cycling trips on my own. Leaving the hustle and bustle of the city, making my way throughout the suburbs and into the swamp, castles, and sand dunes, going up big hills to then go back down. Granted, I have no idea if this footage really conveys how quick I was going, but trust me, I was picking up some speed. Because of this, I even been thinking about getting an e-bike mod for the Sonic Blue, i.e. my custom-made, fitted, tailor-built, made bikey, so I can go even faster, no license. Would certainly make going up those hills easy though for the time being let's just stick to speeding in video games how about that is is, is that a frog crossing sign oh yeah if you ask me, Ridge Racer 7 is one of those titles that perfectly embodies the vibe of the system it was made for. I am, of course, talking about the sleek, black, fancy piano, high and expensive piece of tech, big futuristic money pretensions of the PS3, which are seven mirrors with sexy clean menus and UI and a colder, darker palette with vaguely gothic vibes that have a light veneer of futurism about them. Dare I say it, so fist of future. Even the soundtrack forgoes the jazzy DMB or uppity gabber and rave of Ridge's raced past, opting instead for minimal tech house mid 2000s trance music. Always scripsy, bassy, and forever pulsating. Sistering neatly with its coinciding Tekken release, 6, but having more of the ethereal natures of 4 for good measure, too. Fittingly including its airport stage. Which I love in concept alone, but how this bitch unfurls through tunnels exiting into big cityscapes in tandem with how the music can them and is likely to drop peak in progress is fucking incredible. Pretty sure also this spot right here is the area from Tech 1's opening FMV. Which... 
I mean, that's kind of the thing, too. While it is a very serious feeling game, it's Steffo also still Party Namco Cameo Confetti Upon Finish Ridge Racer under the hood. There are some really bright and colorful levels up in this bitch. Bloomy ones, wet ones, sunny ones, dark ones, urban, rural, suburban, and even industrial ones. Such a perfect counter to the schoolgirl zombie shit's monotony. Not to mention how ridiculous these cars look, still handling exactly like how the series has since 4 as well, with those trademark cartoon drifts that see the player damn near spinning about their own axis, which I fucking love. It's so no holes barred, all speed everything, but within the context of these turbo coco cars that sound like F1 engines, it lends the sensation that these ain't even normal modern day earth vehicles to begin with. Like, I mean, they're also glossy and bulbous, shiny and clean in contrast to the grit of the level. It's as if the fantasy of cars realized most loudly and dumbly, but also stylistically. I've uh, defo mentioned this before, but <laughs> I don't really like cars that much IRL. I didn't grow up with them, I'm from a country where they're not at all needed whatsoever, and thus also entirely not prioritized infrastructurally. That puts it at odds with most of the world, and so I'm a little at odds with them too. However, concept cars, that's a different story. First of all, they ain't real, so they can't hurt nobody, and also they look so fucking cool. No production means no profit motive, means no capital cucking designs to suit some fucking focus group middle of the road common denominator. These things can wrist race all over the place. Which is honestly what the cars in R7 remind me a lot of. Fake cars made by car designers at Max Creative. Daring and experimental with no real need to care for the practicality or realism of them actually existing. That latter part, the game itself certainly also has in spades. I mean, control-wise, things seem to be even glidier and more frictionless than even 4 already was, and this is smack dab in the middle of the nitrous trend too, which also adds to the lunacy of the feel overall. Especially because the nitro refills through drifting, which is on some heckin' kart racer type shit. Complete maniac driving is encouraged. Okay, pause. D do you see that? It's like I rubber banded in real time. This can also really come back to haunt you, being that... I have no idea what the heck even happened here. That stuff can be very frustrating, but it's barely a blemish on the immense dumb fun that I had here, ain't gonna lie. I wanted to simply go no thoughts fast, and goddammit, did I ever pick the perfect game to do that with? Even if the PS3 hacking attempt was a disaster. Though I will say, it is odd to see the console still get updates while the PlayStation Store thumbnail showcase is permanently stuck in 2016. Turn up messy though with the intensity blur, that's almost as funny as this old piece of Pro Evo box art. You know, it might not be the final box art, but at least it's not in association with Pringles. <laughs>